Today, I'm here with Matt Wenning, one of the strongest people in the world, literally. He has set and broken several powerlifting records, and the world is a pretty big place. Pretty big place. He has a 611-pound bench press and has squatted 1,197 pounds. Yes, you did hear me right, 1,197 pounds. Wow. He has a master's degree in biomechanics and has had major contracts with the U.S. Armed Forces, such as U.S. Army Rangers, 82nd Airborne, and others. He currently has contracts with four fire departments in the Columbus, Ohio Air Crew. Welcome, Matt. It's a pleasure. How are you doing? Doing great, doing great, doing great. So the four main topics I'd like to cover with you today that I know would really benefit my viewers are, number one, workouts. Number two, nutrition, diet, what you eat. Three, recovery. I know so many don't really appreciate how important recovery is for building muscle and losing fat. You had some very good videos on that. Uh, a couple of things I'd never heard of before watching your videos, actually. And then the four would be whatever topic you feel that's important to help people transform their body so that they look great and feel even better. So does that sound good? Yeah, great. All right. Awesome. So first question to you. How has your training and coaching methods evolved over the years? Any cool stories or any epiphanies? Yeah. Um, a lot of things like, you know, the more educated you get, the more experience you get and the older you get, I find that training changes anywhere from probably seven to 10% per year. If you're actually applying your new education. Okay. So for me, I would say every five years, my training looks pretty different. Um, okay. Whether it be exercises that I utilize um, weaknesses that I find and have to bring out in the training um, mm -hmm. which is a huge importance for almost anyone. And then also um, introducing yourself or being around the right environment that has the right equipment, which I find is a massive limitation for most gym goers. If you go to their normal box gym or a lifetime fitness, they might have flashy stuff, but the stuff that actually works is non-existent. Okay. So it's one of those big things where you have to be very careful. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a navigating um area that, that a lot of people just don't have the base education to do the right things. And then they don't tend to find or try to find the right information until injury occurs. Mm -hmm. You know, usually injury is the thing that draws people into training smarter when yeah. in reality <laughs> that should have been the start at the first place. Yes, this is true. This is true. Yeah. You know, I find it's very difficult to find people like yourself, like even for me and most people, it's, it's almost impossible. Every good trainer I've met or massage therapist, it's almost always word I'm out or just purely accidental. Like I went to a really good gym. I was going to this gym, Redcon One. I met this guy who was a PT learning, who put me in contact with this other guy, who put me with this other guy, and the guy was amazing, <laughs> you know, or my first you know, coach. This I think the hardest part is, especially what I find today is that highly educated people are not often sought after they're sought after these gimmicks. You know, the average person yes. gets calls for these 30 day and 60 day challenges and these yeah. one month workouts and these mm -hmm. weird memberships that are doing these hit <laughs> training courses and stuff that really, if you start looking at the skeleton of the actual design mm -hmm. of the workouts is just setting people up for failure and injury. Yes. Um, we've also done that to ourselves in general society because we have um, we have fallen for these tricks for so long that the average person that's actually trying to do a good job and teach the right things is oftentimes ignored, yep. neglected, or they're not sought after. So at the end of the day, like you're saying, it's it's hard to find the right people because uh -huh. for some reason or another, um, the marketing and like YouTube channel, for example, doesn't grab people that are highly educated. It grabs people that have a shock factor. Yes. Yep. And Unfortunately, like there is, I saw a video, this lady did something where she was literally saying, if you twirl your arms, you lose the arm fat, right? And she had a couple million views. Exactly. And guarantee you, there are a lot of people who are there twirling their arms and wondering, what's going on? I'm not losing my arm fat or my bra fat. Because, <laughs> you know, it's unfortunate. These people, they're very good at what they do and they know people want to believe. So if I want to believe something and you come along and you look the part, and I said, yeah. man, that guy, he's strong. He looks muscly. He told me if I just twirl my arms, I'll be strong like him. Well, what, what do I have to lose? Let me twirl my arms. This literally is what happens, unfortunately. Yeah, I think the hardest part people don't want to realize is that if it was simple, everybody would be in shape. Yes. 
if it was easy, more people would be in the gym. Yes. And if it wasn't educational, a lot more people would be world-class. But the problem is, is that most of the people in every sport are world-class because they're genetic freaks, not because they're smart. Yeah. Right. We look up to people like, I mean, you can name a ton in the powerlifting mm-hmm. industry, but you know, Michael Jordan was Michael Jordan because of his work ethic. Yeah. Right. He's a, he's the greatest of all time because of his work ethic, mm-hmm. not necessarily because his physical skills I'm not saying he wasn't a great jumper or a great shooter. Right, right, right. He willed himself to be that good. Yes. <laughs> Whereas most people, if it's not handed to them, they're like, screw mm-hmm. it. I don't, yes. <laughs> I don't want it. And a lot of it, you can tell by how much work ethic it is out of someone's specificity, meaning Jordan was constantly lifting weights. He was yeah. doing things outside of the basketball court to be the best, mm-hmm. where everybody else was just relying on if they had it or they didn't have it. So. Yes. Um, and it's not to, not to harp on just Jordan too much, but that's my point is like for most people that they idolize like a Larry wheels or something like that, like mm-hmm. not very many people are going to pick up weights and be world champions by the time no. they're 19. No, it's going to be a long <laughs> endeavor. Yeah. With that being said, you need to select methods and training styles that are going to reduce or eliminate as much as possible. The mileage that is approached to on the skeletal system, meaning, you know, mm. if you have the bench press program, it'll get you strong really fast, yeah. but grenades your shoulders and screws up your elbows. That's not going to be any good for yes. most people because to be a good bench presser, you're probably going to need to last fairly injury free for 10 to 15 years. Okay. Right. So I remember the first time I benched 500, I'd already been training for nine and a half years. Okay. Wow. With no breaks. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's a good thing. And what's that rule? General thumb takes like 10,000 hours to become an expert in anything. But in today's yeah, society, everybody wants to be an expert that. overnight. In my opinion, I think it's 100% true. 10 years, 10,000 hours. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Right. You, t- you touched on something interesting with people with incredible genetics in that some of these people who are famous and blah, 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 if they, if you clone them, they couldn't coach themselves. Meaning if you took the younger version of them and say, hey, coach that person, that guy, that lady, they couldn't transform themselves into themselves <laughs> because they I don't really know. A, I had a talk with a really good friend that's also a world record holder just a couple of days ago, and mm-hmm. he is very, very proficient in what he does, but mm-hmm. his coaching capacities are not very high. And I said, if I were you, I would start focusing on the things that you can replicate because you being able to do it just to yourself doesn't mm-hmm. make you marketable. It's mm. like you have to slowly work yourself away from being the circus sideshow freak to the person running the circus. And yeah. most athletes can't do that. Right. Yeah. You know, you touch on something. Now think about it. And you see this in basketball a lot where former players were terrible coaches. Yeah. Because they, 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 they and they're dealing with elite athletes. So it's not like they're dealing with scrubs, right? <laughs> they're not coaching jo- yeah. the general population and they still couldn't I mean, yeah, in reality, if you think about it, the three best coaches that were players at one time, mm-hmm. Phil Jackson. Yeah. Right? Agreed. Um, the guy that uh, – Stephen Kerr that coaches the Warriors. Steve Kerr, yes. Mm-hmm. Because of his work ethic, he wasn't the best in the league. He had no, he was not. <laughs> off to be good. Yeah. Then third, Larry Bird from my home state. Yes. Yeah. He coached the Pacers to nearly a couple finals. Yes, I remember. And his work ethic was unbelievable as well as genetics. Yes. So again, you start to look at all these players that become good coaches because they were the ones that had to work hard to be good. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was a Bulls fan, so I know all about Steve Kerr. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. But he was ready when Jordan finally passed that ball at critical three. He made it. He was ready, you know. So he was yeah, ready. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, you keep on yeah, so many, so many good things there a while ago, right? Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So the next thing is you had this really great video about how to get bigger with some hypertrophy. Tips. One of them, actually, well, there's three tips really. You talk about focus on eccentrics, full range of motion, and the need to get stronger. The eccentric one was very cool, I thought, because I know most of you don't know what. And then the last one, the get stronger to be able to use heavier weights, so to speak, for to do for reps. You know, right. could you talk about those three: the eccentrics, the full range of yeah. motion, and the need to get stronger? So, if you really study a lot of the highly advanced textbooks, they're going to tell you that hypertrophy is mostly created in the downward motion anyway. So, mm-hmm. as the muscles controlling the downward face, say in a bench press, right, you're having to control those weights. Those muscle fibers are becoming damaged as they lengthen. Mm-hmm. So, the actus and myosin cross bridges get broken actually at a more severe level on eccentric training. 
So right. when you slow down your eccentrics, you're not only putting on more muscle mass, you're getting more benefit out of the same amount of repetitions, mm -hmm. which is also reducing mileage at the joint. Ah, yes. Right? Because <laughs> now you're using the joint in less time. Yeah. As far as how many reps, but more time as far as how long the reps take. Mm. So the range of motion is increasing in its time or slowing in speed. Yeah. Therefore, you get less damage in certain aspects. And with controlling the eccentrics, also going to limit the amount of resistance you can use. Yes, this is true. Because most, most, what's the stereotype? Most guys lift too heavy, right? <laughs> so if you slow that down to a five, five tempo, meaning five seconds up, five seconds down, you're probably going to get more benefit with less, with less risk of injury. Wait, yes, yeah, that, that is so true. Less, and you can better feel the muscle as well, which right. goes into the second one, your full range of motion. You did, uh, <clears throat> I think it was a Instagram short, which is hilarious because I just saw this recently when I visited a family in Texas and I'm from Jamaica originally, but I live in Florida uh -huh. and I saw this guy squatting like four or five, but he would go down like three inches and then back up three inches and he was even bending his back. And after, yeah, uh, he, he, yeah, I wanted to go and say something, but I, I'm hesitant. I typically only talk to guys if they look older, to be honest, because younger guys tend to be like, they already know everything. So Oh, yeah. I just left him alone, but you did <laughs> full range of motion. Yeah, full, and full range of motion can be different. It, full range of motion can sometimes be limited on the skeletal health. So yeah. some people, I'll give you an example. Back in the 60s and 70s when the Bulgarians were at the height of their Olympic lifting um, prowess, okay. they would have to do x-rays on the children in their hip sockets. And if their hip sockets weren't perfectly formed, mm -hmm. they wouldn't even put them in the program. Oh, wow. They're not going to withstand the loading. So yeah. this means sometimes we have anthropometric limitations to full range motion, mm -hmm. but oftentimes it's just where egos get in the way. Yes. And we also haven't been taught proper form in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So um, full range of motion, if you think about muscle as this long piece of fiber, the longer you stretch it, there's a lot of bodybuilders that talk about fully lengthening the muscle tissue in order mm -hmm. to stretch the fascia to give the muscle more room to grow. Well, if you're doing limited range of motion exercises, your muscle has no extra room to grow because the fascia is still tight. Right. Now, so that's theoretical, but in my opinion, it makes sense. It does. Um, <laughs> with full range of motion, as the fascia gets more stretched, the muscle has more room to grow. Think of it like a mm -hmm. snake, for example. Okay. If I buy a snake from the pet store and it's only a foot long and I keep it in a two by two foot cage, it won't mm -hmm. grow. If I put it in a six by six foot cage, it'll start growing because it has more room right. to grow. That makes right. a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, that's and then, of course, it's safer as well because typically when I see it, I use a squat as an example because when I've seen guys warm up, let's say they, they can squat parallel with 135 or less, but at some point, their range of motion just keeps decreasing as the weight goes up. And you know now they're just ego lifting, essentially. But they can tell people, yeah, I squat 315, but... Do they really squat? Through? They, they'd be much better off doing what you say to use a lighter weight and just build. But it's back to what you talked about earlier. People want something now. They don't want to wait. They don't want to wait 10 years or five years to get to a true 315 squat. They want it in three months or something. Yeah, which is nearly impossible for a lot of people. And the other big thing is, too, is it starts to create muscular imbalances when you don't use fuller ranges of motion, right? Because you're only attacking a limited range of that joint. Mm -hmm. And so if you can do full range of motion exercises, you're going to get a little bit bigger, a little faster. The last one that a lot of people still don't understand, especially in the bodybuilding realm, think about, in theory, two of the best bodybuilders that's ever lived in the last 30 years, Dorian Yates and Ronnie Coleman, both were yes. berserker strong. Yes. <laughs> When they would step on stage against other people that train like bodybuilders, mm -hmm. they would decimate them because of their muscle density. Yes. And the reason is because they use massive compound movements. I mean, Ronnie Coleman squatted 800 for a double yes. six weeks out from the Olympia. Yeah, I, ha I, have, the, I have his DVD. <laughs> yeah. yes. So the point yeah. is, is that although, you know, people could argue, did it, did it damage him more than mm -hmm. helped him as far as in the long run? Who knows? But he goes down as one of the best bodybuilders to ever yes. live. Same as Dorian Yates, and it's because they trained heavy and yes. they were able to attack those muscles at an almost gargantuan level. Yeah. Now, what that does to help the average person is, let's say I can only bench press 225. Mm -hmm. My ability to use 100-pound dumbbells for sets of 20 is not going to happen. Right. It is too close to my max. 
But if I'm a 500 pound bencher, now the hundred pound dumbbells are warm ups. Yes. <laughs> so who's going to get bigger? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You you know, for the longest time, up to two years ago, I was resistant to the bench. I guess somebody with the shoulders at the angle. I was always just using dumbbells, and I got up to like eighty dot pound, ninety pounds where I could do them properly. I would say not nonsense reps. Then I started benching and I was doing them properly. And I, my best is 315 for two, right? But when I went down and I did it for a while, to from 225 to 185, this is literally what you said. I got more out of it because I could do more reps and I could control it better. And my chest felt like it was going to blow up when I get off the bench. And I was like, I'm really using more of the chest versus my back, you know, my feet, all yeah. the other <laughs> musculature just taking over. But now imagine this. Imagine if you could do all those reps with 315. Yes, then I'd really, <laughs> yeah. But your bench would have to climb to 455, 500 to be able to do right. that. So the point is, is that strength limits the ability to do reps with a sub-maximum weight. Yes, I agree. I agree. That, you know, it's funny because the, the second one, full range of motion, people lift too heavy typically. But with the third point, you need to get stronger. But it's, it's almost like people, if they would take the, t- say, let's say the guy with a 315 squat, he rushed it. But if he took his time adding five pounds, two and a half pounds or even less per week or every two weeks or whatever, and year by year by year got legitimately got there, then he would have the best of both worlds. He would be as strong as he wanted to be and he would look better as well. So yeah, win, win, win all around. And let's like the the issue is timeline. Yes. People's timelines are too short. I remember when Ed Cohen, which was the greatest power lifter ever lived, broke 75 Mm -hmm. world records, saw me squat my first 700 as a junior. And he said, hey, if you can hold together for another five to eight years, you're going to squat 800. Well, I did it in a year and a half. Oh, wow. <laughs> the point is, is that he was asking me that to test what my mentality was. Because when he said that, uh, I didn't have this surprise look at his face. Okay. And my mind was like, screw it. I like yeah. training anyway. I don't care how yeah. I <laughs> Right. So he knew that my timeline was correct yeah. to be a champion. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's just, almost the same thing with weight loss, right? Because our likes are smoking. If you smoke today, the consequences could be decades from now, right? It's not like, oh, next week I get lung cancer. Similarly, you start working out, you don't immediately get strong like you next week or look muscular like you next week, right? So it's harder for people to keep going, keep going, keep going. So I've been fat twice before. I lost 65 pounds one, got fat a second time, got lucky, as mentioned earlier, run into a really good trainer and she helped transform me. And and I was like you, I was just taking my time, taking my time. And I would watch people, but I couldn't say anything because I was fat and weak, but I'd watch them and something told me they were doing the wrong things, right? Either they were just lifting too heavy or they weren't trying hard enough in, in my mind, or they were rushing things. And a year, two years later, almost all those people, they literally looked the same, but I had transformed in those two years. And in some cases surpassed them, you know, in year three, four, five, and what have you. But I think it's everything you just said, the lack of patience. Let's say, yeah, longevity, patience, consistency Uh are always going to be your best friend as far as real gains are concerned. Right. (laughs) This is true. So what would you recommend to a regular person who wants to get big and strong? Let's say someone's new to the gym or they've been lifting on and off for several years and they're effectively still a beginner, let's say. What would you recommend? The best thing to do is go learn from experts. I, I, you don't know how many times I get people that email me or mm. direct message me and they're like, man, I'd really like to come to one of your seminars, but I feel like I need to be stronger first. That's the number one biggest mistake. Yes, You want to go learn from stronger guys when you're a beginner yes. because they, they have already been where you're at and they know how to get there without getting hurt. Yes. So I find that you start to see that a lot of these people that hide themselves until they feel strong, Mm -hmm. what happens is they create all these imbalances and weaknesses and now they're accumulating injuries and now they get smart behind the eight ball. Yes. (laughs) Which is a bad idea. So go and go and learn. And remember one of the biggest things that I tell people all the time is read as much as you train. Right. Uh I mean, if you go into my library, like, dude, you got these many books. Yeah. I've read them all and I have, all I have them all highlighted and I have them all yes. stamped because sometimes I need to go back and refresh myself. Yep. But I find that most people, if you start talking about the highest level books to read, mm-hmm. they, they've never even seen them. Yes. Yeah. And so they're putting all of their time and experience in the gym. But how much are you really, how much are you really in love with something if you're not studying it? Yeah. 
Agreed. I agree. So for me personally, I once sat on and calculated some years back that I'd spent over 3,000 hours consuming material. <laughs> no exaggeration, right? And it's like watching videos like what you put out, <clears throat> listen to podcasts, listen to audiobooks, or reading the actual books. But I find sometimes it's with business, just listen to the book and sometimes re-listen to them. And it's so true that knowledge is so critical because you just don't know what you don't know. Some of the things you think are true are not true. Like, Absolutely. I, you know, I was mentioning some of these videos would touch on the recovery ones. I learned some new things, right? And mm-hmm. if you're not trying to constantly learn, like I joke with people, my best deadlift was four or five for two reps. And I jokingly say I did this under adult supervision because the guys at that gym can deadlift six, 700 pounds, whatever. And they would watch me when it was much lighter to court correct my form, et cetera. So I did it on, you know, these guys are in their twenties <laughs> and I'm 49. So, you know, they were far younger than me, but they are, had way more experience than me to lift. You know what I mean? Yeah. So a lot of people, I don't know if it's the ego or shyness or what, but you know, when I see somebody like you, I would, I would go ask them, I'd be like, Hey, why are you doing this that way? Or what is that you're doing? And most of the time, Practically every time they'd be willing to explain to me because it's passionate for them, right? So they're going to love to talk about it, whatever it is. Guy, ladies, I'd see a lady in some kind of curl, hamstring. I'm like, why are you doing it this way? She would stop, explain to me. She would watch me, course correct me again. And I've gotten so much good help. And this is what's helped prevent, well, I've injured myself for sure, but it's definitely prevented me really hurting myself, I think. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the thing of it is, too, is education has to be applied with application. So you need to read it, you need to absorb it, then you need to use it. True. And that's another big issue that we have is we have two different sides and it it will probably always be this way. You have the guys that are the meatheads in the gym that don't read a whole lot, don't Mm -hmm. really understand what they're doing. And then you have the professors that have read everything, but have applied nothing. Yes. (laughs) So there's that middle person that every generation, um, you know, back in the seventies and eighties, it was Fred Hatfield, Dr. Scott. He squatted yeah, a thousand squat, yeah. 232. He figured out compensatory acceleration, what it meant to get faster, to get stronger. Mm-hmm. And he studied and did it. Yeah. You know, and so every once in a while, you run into a generation, a person that's well read and mm-hmm. well applied. And now their information is beyond what yes. that generation is. And it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. No, you're so true. Cause you're not part of it is I'm just really curious. So, and I'm not shy. So when I see people doing like knee wraps, right? That's all these guys, young guys lifting heavyweights. I'm like, well, why do you wear these things? And what are they? What do you, do you think I should wear them? And they would make yeah. recommendations. Then it's like, well, my knees feel better. You know, it's helping my squat, et cetera. You know, so I think you have to be intellectually curious, whether you research on your own or you see somebody, as you said, you who knows what they're doing more. It's likely you go talk to them and maybe they tell you something that sounds crazy. They say, okay, maybe they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you at least... Listen, you give it, give it a try, right? It, it can't hurt. You know? Absolutely. They're, most likely they're where you want to be. Yeah. <laughs> is going back to that, you know, go and seek people that are, are where you want to be. Yes. yes. Emulate what they do because they've learned something along the way that you could pick up faster. So like, you know, when I trained at Westside Barbell under Louis mm-hmm. Simmons, he taught me just as much of what to do as what not to do. But if mm-hmm. I was there, I would have learned either. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, no, no. This is true. It's just, yeah, you're right. Because I remember I was going to this LA Fitness in Delray Beach. And I remember wondering when I'd go in there, it's like, are they screening people? Because all the guys look great. All the ladies look great. It's the first gym I've ever seen like that. There were more fit, good looking, athletic people, strong people than the opposite. <laughs> and I, I was in the other category, chubby, fat, <laughs> what have you. But I could see where I was trying to get to, you know, so that, that helped motivation wise, talking to people. And you, it's one thing to think, oh, I want to do this. But when you see it being done, you can say, man, yeah, I could get there one day, you know? So it really, it really does help. I agree 100%. Well, that. and, that's, and that's a huge thing about putting yourself in a position where you see things that are possible. I think one of the big things that made me super strong very quickly was the fact that the first person that taught me to bench was a 500 pound bencher at 181 body weight. So wow. when I first see him as a kid in sixth yeah. grade, I'm watching him bench press five plates wow. and he's 180, 81 pounds and hmm. he wants to teach me. Yeah. And I'm over years because I can't even bench <laughs> a plate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but my point was, he was like, no, you don't worry about how much is on the bar. Yeah. Focus on your technique and the weight yeah. will come. Yeah. And he was right. Five, six years later, I smoked 500. Yeah. Wow. 
Now, that's a great story. Now, that is a great story because, you know, yeah, back to the ego thing. Like you said, you couldn't bench a plate. So a lot of guys will go in there and it's as if they think, at least is what I think, they think everybody's staring at them, but actually nobody's staring at you. <laughs> they don't care if you got to put 10 pounds on each side. Because I remember when yeah. I was there, 10 pounds thinking, is everybody watching me? And then I was like, no, nobody's watching me. So I, that's all I could do was the 10 pounds on each side. So yeah. it is what it is. I could, you know? Do, you know, I could do the plate, but I couldn't do it right. And I was going to end okay. up hurting myself. And yeah. this guy, this guy's showing me all these little things I never even thought of. And yeah. then five, six years later, I get introduced to Louie and he's showing me things that I really hadn't thought of. Yeah, <laughs> It was one of those things though, like some of that knowledge is actually earned by putting in the work. You know, people that have the high level knowledge recognize people that want to put in the work too. Yes, this is true. Right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. I've noticed that uh, like I used to play chess. I remember you probably do something similar to plants where the people that really are passionate, they probably get extra time. Like say a session is an hour. They get that extra 15 minutes, 10, 30 minutes or whatever, because the coach, the trainer, the teacher, the professor, they can tell that this student is passionate and they will put more, they'll pour more into it. It's just human nature, I think, pour more Absolutely. into that person. Absolutely. For sure. What are your thoughts on bands? Like uh, you did a video, you did a good video on bands. The reason I ask is I know they're very popular, but um, what are your thoughts on bands in the gym? Do you need to be pretty strong to need bands beyond just the plates and then bands for the person who's working at home who has no equipment, let's say. just a home I mean, uh, There's all kinds of different applications for the band tension. Mm -hmm. uh, when used correctly in a powerlifting sense, you do need to have a baseline of really good technical proficiency because band mm -hmm. training is not only extra weight, it's extra acceleration. So ah. when you tie a band to a bar, it's throwing mm -hmm. it down faster than 9.81 meters per second. Think about okay. this perspective. If I take a band up into the space shuttle and stretch yeah. it, it's still yeah. functioning. But right. a chain or a barbell weighs nothing. Ah, so man. bars and plates mm. and kettlebells need gravity to function and bands right. create an elastic environment, which the muscle tissue has to adapt to at a completely different level. Okay. So I find that band training usually doesn't work well with combined with weight training mm -hmm. until the intermediate and advanced level. That because your timing already sucks anyway when you're a yes. beginner. So <laughs> adding something that throws in a whole nother ball to the game is, yeah. is very difficult. But when utilized for accessory work like tricep pushdowns, face pulls, um, things of that nature, you can use those at any stage. Okay. And it's a very big help for people that might be at a home gym that may mm -hmm. not have access to all of the fancy isolated pieces. They can do a lot of that stuff with band tension. Okay, got you. That's a great answer, particularly the part about the, the bar, because, yeah, I'm glad I did, definitely didn't try that. Um, again, I only do these things under adult supervision. <laughs> yeah, my you. gut instinct told me that it, nothing good, either it wouldn't be necessary based on my strength level, or I would hurt myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were partially right, but, you yeah. know, the thing is, is there when you get to a certain point where you can use the band tension mm -hmm. with the weight training, as far as hooking it to barbells and such, yeah. One, your technique has to be good. And two, you have to be strong enough to have the right percentages. So mm -hmm. there is an optimal amount of band tension to weight ratio okay. that elicits a proper change for a lot of people. And I see it all the time on Instagram and whatever. They're mm -hmm. setting it up completely incorrectly. Okay. So they don't have any idea how it works and they're not thinking of the physics. So then you have something that's not transferable. It doesn't work. Oh, okay. So there's, so there's a waste a, of time, basically. The mathematics and understanding of it, you know, but yeah. uh, at the end of the day, it becomes second nature after a while once you learn it. Okay, gotcha. That's a great, that's another great point on the bands. There's a, so if somebody wanted to learn that, what would be the best way to figure that out, let's say? Because it's not very intuitive, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those things. I, to be honest with you, it's an answer I don't have because okay. I was introduced to it so long ago that it's like second nature to me. Okay. But there gotcha. are very, very few of us that understand that. I would say myself, mm -hmm. Dave Tate, um, there's uh, Zach Evanish out in New Jersey would know. Mm -hmm. um, Joe DeFranco in Jersey would know. Okay. Um, a handful of the old school, old school West Side guys that really don't coach anymore would know. Um, th and there's probably other guys that I can't think of right now, mm -hmm. but it's kind of a lost art okay. again, because it's a small group of people that really understood everything it mm -hmm. translates to. And the average person doesn't have access to those people like what you're talking about. Yes. Yep. It's a niche thing. 
Well, I mean, I mean, I'm going to put all your social information in the body of the video, et cetera, and on Instagram, but I know you sell really good products. Do you have anything on bands like a book yeah. or videos or anything like that? Yes, we have a book called Bands, Chains, and Specialty Bars that kind of goes over and touches okay. all that. Okay, perfect. I will put that in the show notes as well because, yeah, knowledge is power and, yeah. Yeah, we'll also have a massive chapter on that in the new book that's going to be out probably at the beginning okay. of 2024. So I'm finishing that now, going okay. to edit it. But we basically dove into everything I could find with all the references of okay. how to use it and set it up. So that'll be in nice. the book as well. Okay, nice, nice, nice. Yeah, I'll definitely get myself a copy of that. So yeah. now these next couple of questions may seem very simplistic, but many people don't really know how to go to the gym on a regular basis. So bear with yeah. me. How do you plan your day to make sure you go to the gym? Well, for me, it's difficult because I my job is the gym. Okay. Uh, but for the average person, the trick mm -hmm. is, is you have to figure out a way initially to make it non-stressful and don't put any pressure on yourself. You know, most people go in and they want results too fast. Yeah. They want to be experts too fast. And then they burn out instead of just being a student of the game. Yeah. So I feel that that is a huge issue for most people quitting. The next thing is, is go to an environment that's constructive, but also one that, you know, every place that I trained with, I had to kind of earn my spot, which is a way that they weeded people out. Mm. And that's not necessarily good for most people that aren't competitive. Yeah. So if you're a not competitive person, be careful going to a competitive gym. Yeah. Find a place that suits your personality, mm. your particular, you know, what your goals are going to be. Yeah. And, and follow those particular parameters because you, you go to a place that's everybody's elite and everybody is no nonsense and everybody wants yeah. to be a champion. <laughs> you just want to be the strongest guy at Walmart. Yeah. Not be a good fit. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's a, yeah, that's a brilliant insight because yeah, I am competitive type A personality. So I liked those environments because they pushed me. I call it positive peer pressure. <laughs> that's the way I viewed it. You know, so I like that kind. But you're right; some people are the total opposite, and yeah, that, that's that's going to demotivate men. And you touched on something in the first really good point you made regarding motivation isn't enough. Because when I did research on how to create habits, they said while you need it, that's actually the least one of the least important parts. Because it's like the New Year's resolution; it starts and then gradually fizzles out. But you want to have some kind of a prompt or a cue to remind you to do the thing over and over and yeah. then make the good habits easier. As you've said, less stressful environment. You know, yeah. the gym bag is in the bag already packed in the night before. So you see it, the gym is on the way home yeah. from work. So you just stop, you're, you're making it easier for you. Just exactly what you, you said. Develop, you have to develop dedication and then motivation retains. If you're only, your only mm -hmm. drive is motivation. You're probably not going to be around very long because motivation mm -hmm. goes in and goes out. There's, thousands of times in the last 15, 20 years that I didn't want to go to the gym. Yeah. And then in my mind, I'm like, it, I literally, I've done it once. Okay. So I turned my car around and went home one <laughs> time, probably about seven years ago. Okay. Right, right about when I, well, eight uh, five years ago, about when I retired from mm -hmm. competitive lifting, which yeah. I, if you watch my Instagram, I'm still in comp competition shape. I just don't compete. Compete, but, yes. But, um, I turned around and I literally couldn't sleep that night. Oh, wow. Because my brain was so wired to go, this is where you belong. Yeah. You don't want to be like everybody else. And you just did what everybody else does. Yeah. Wow. And that literally would not turn off in my head, which is probably <laughs> why I'm a champion, but it's yeah. probably also some sort of a mental disorder. <laughs> no, no. You know, I heard a gentleman say this on a podcast. I don't remember what, but he said, he spoke to this world-class trainer, trained many champions. And he says like, what sets them apart? And the guy said the typical thing, oh, the genetics, blah, blah, blah. They, but the one thing the guy said that's really stuck with him, and it shocked me too, he said, people like yourself, is the days they don't miss. It's, they, they just don't miss those days. Like, you literally just told me the past five years, there's this one time and it's, you that it traumatized you, <laughs> essentially. And you can remember this, where most people can't remember how many times they didn't go last month six months ago or what have you, right? And th that was one of the things that surprised me too when I heard it, but it makes so much sense, right? Because all those days that are not missed that accumulate over the years gets to that 10,000 hours, gets to you setting world records, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then what you have to find is that as you get older and as you get a little bit more limited in your recovery, sometimes mm -hmm. taking those days off helps. 
Yes. But the problem is, is you're not wired to do that. So um, you find that it's a catch 22. And so right. what, what, if you read a lot of the high level Russian Soviet texts, they talk about, they have big, hard, condensed four week training blocks mm-hmm. and they take two <laughs> to three days down to let their bodies recover. Yeah. The deload. Yeah. But how yeah, many any- times have you heard any of these athletes or any of these guys at the gym ever do that <laughs> until they get injured? And then they yes. just get a little elbow bruise or, you know, they get <laughs> something that's small that heals in a week. Right. Yeah. Then they come back to the gym and they're stronger, but they didn't even yep. put two and two together. Yeah, I, I did. I, I figured that one out on my own. That's one of the things I did figure out. I would notice when I would stop for a couple of days or a week or two, or something in my body, my brain would just tell me to just not go. I couldn't really explain, but I'm a big fan of listening to your body. Very big fan of that. Maybe it's because I was at these like skin conditions yeah. and I'm very sensitive to food and things like that break up. So if I feel off, I'd be like, yeah, let me not eat any more of that. So I would just feel to just stop. I can't explain. And when I go back, get yeah, Every the way it's just always felt lighter. I just felt like I'm ready to jump through the gym roof or something. Exactly. Energy. Yeah, exactly what you said. Exactly. Fully recovered. And it's, it's funny because a lot of people just don't pick that up, but that's actually because your body works in three week waves. So, what okay. I would strongly suggest, and this is still theoretical, they still haven't really proven a lot of this, but look up okay. something called biorhythms. Okay. I'll look that's how up. your body responds to strength training, mm-hmm. to education, a lot of things, but biorhythms. Is a thing to look at that the Russians were studying dramatically, and a lot of which okay. was created around periodization. So oh, how you yeah. optimally had some some stuff to do with biorhythms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes so much sense because everything goes in cycles with the human body. You see, with sleep, hormones, everything. Yeah, everything is very cyclical. Yeah, that that does make a lot of sense. <clears throat> Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. Huh. Okay. So you touched on some of the psychology to get people to train, how you need to train them. Um, let's see. So everyone, right, beginner or professional athlete has done some crazy things in the gym. <clears throat> okay, this is the last question in the workout section. <laughs> and they were lucky, you know, hopefully to not really hurt themselves too badly or hurt themselves at all. Do you have any such crazy stories, <laughs> either for yourself or anybody else that you know? Uh, give, me, give me an example of a story you're kind of looking for. And I probably got something. Well, let's see. I remember... Friend of mine, squat, what did he squat? Five, six, I don't remember. Five or 600, one or two. Very, very strong dude. And he did some craziness with trying to, what, no, not that that weighed much lighter when he was younger, trying to tie the bar to himself for some craziness. But he luckily he fell forward on the pins and didn't, nothing terrible happened to him. He didn't snap anything. Very, yeah, he said it was very stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm trying to think, um, you know, a lot of the guys I trained with were so elite. We didn't try anything too crazy, but crazy. Yeah. I will tell you a, a heavy injury story. So okay. my ex training partner, Vlad, which was the first man to squat 1250 at super heavyweight. Oh, so wow. we had an all time human world record, regardless mm-hmm. of weight class. Okay. Um, five to six weeks after he did that, he was training for another contest using weights that he shouldn't have been playing with because he didn't recover fast enough. Okay. Yeah. And he tore both patella tendons completely off Ooh. with a massive amount of weight, like somewhere around 1300 pound range. Wow. And um, it took him, it took him quite a, quite a few years to come back. And when mm-hmm. he did, he took the all time raw squat record after they fixed his knees. Oh, Talk wow. about mental animal, but you know, yeah. we did a lot of crazy things at Westside Barbell, mm-hmm. you know, tons of okay. stories of crazy lifts and things like that. But (laughs) I've actually sheltered myself away from a lot of the insanity. So is the stuff you see on Instagram. Yes. Oh my goodness. The stuff that I see too. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, the thing of it is you have to be very careful, especially this day and age to train. Yes. um, Not necessarily for YouTube and Instagram likes or TikTok views, but Mm -hmm. more for a long-term progression and injury reduction. And I think that's becoming a huge problem. Oh, yeah, because, you know, like I said, I'm 49. I, you know, when my dad's 75, and he's always lived the life. He's like you, basically. So I remember when I was in my teenage years, I could sit on his back and he could crank out 50 push ups. <laughs> and wow. I, it's not like I was light either, right? <laughs> I was not light sure. teenager. So he's always lived the life. But even at his age, going on like 77 now, everything works. Everything works. He can just split down. He can do anything. He doesn't move like he moves like he's in his late forties. No exaggeration. Yeah, you know, move, he just works. Move keeps you healthy and keeps you young. Yes. Yeah. Problem is, most people as they get older and a little stiffer, it doesn't mm-hmm. mean that you don't have to modify. 
what right. you're doing, you absolutely will. But you need to maintain functionality and movement yes. and some level of strength. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of papers out now in the medical field that are talking about hand strength being one of the predominant factors to mortality. Mm. So when your hands are weak, your whole body's yeah. weak. Yeah. Which that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, which is also why I'm very against using straps to lift weights. Yeah. You know, straps Rip tend strength. to block the hand from getting stronger, yes. developing other parts of the body, body. And you see a lot of injuries happen because the grip is usually a good indicator to the brain of when to stop. When you can't hold it, mm -hmm. you probably should be doing it. Well, so true story. When I was transforming the second time, I started doing a lot of dumbbell work. <laughs> and because my grip wasn't that strong, I was using wraps, right? I was using tons of dumbbells and I messed up my forearms. <laughs> Just yeah. to your point. You know, I had to get therapy. Thankfully, I didn't hurt anything other than missing the forearms. But yeah, it makes a difference when you get the grip strength up. Because like you said, you're, you know, say a lat pull down and you're using weights that you can't possibly use way beyond you. But the, the wraps allow you to pull them down. But perhaps there's something in your lower back that can't handle that weight yet. You know, you're the muscular, your hip, your glutes are too weak or whatever, <laughs> you know. So you're now pulling weight that while you can pull it, you shouldn't be pulling it, so to speak. Yeah. Two ways it's a good point. Very good point. Of each other. Actually, there's three, but two to make it simple. Mm -hmm. You have an inferent pathway, which is your brain telling your muscle to do something. Mm -hmm. Then you have an inferent pathway, which is your muscle telling your brain where it's at in conjunction with the movement and what it can withstand. Okay. The hand has the most nerves in your body as far as those afferent, efferent motor patterns. Okay. And so when it starts to sense that it cannot do it, it shuts the rest of the body down and protects it. If wow. that's guarded with straps and you can't yeah. feel it, your incidence of hurting it is higher because you've lost appropriate reception. Yeah. Oh, wow. I did not know that. That's And that makes so much sense when you think about it. This is a self-regulating system, basically. It's a good control in place. And then you have interneurons, which speak to the afferent and efferent on both sides, but mm -hmm. that gets a little bit complex. But if you think okay. about it, you need both of those pathways. And everybody's worried about the signal from the brain to the muscle mm -hmm. to get it to do something, but nobody talks about the signal that the muscle is sending back to the brain to protect itself. Yeah. Yes. Right. That's, that's, that's a great point, man. Yeah, that alone was worth <laughs> this interview because yeah. why it's so important to have muscular balance, i.e. one of the most important mm -hmm. factors that is quadricep to hamstring ratio. Yes. So hamstring ratio is roughly 65% of your quad. If it's worse than that, the mm -hmm. chances of injury are high, both in the leg and the lower back. Yeah. Because it's not balanced. And because mm -hmm. those afferent, afferent motor patterns, they can't sync with each other. Now you're using the wrong muscles at the wrong time, putting yourself in a biomechanical disadvantage at the point. I think that has happened to many people. What you said, the quad hamstring imbalance. <laughs> I'm thinking of someone. It's very simple to start with because we all start that way because mm -hmm. of the patella. So if you look at the patella as your kneecap, it's not only a protective mechanism if you're kneeling, mm -hmm. but it's also a lever. So all those big mm -hmm. muscles come down to that kneecap and they go over the joint. There's right. no other joint like that in your body. So the mm -hmm. hamstring is already at a disadvantage due to the joint mechanics. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> that makes you have to train the hamstring very, very hard in mm -hmm. order to maintain some form of a ratio that's within re in reason. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Now, regarding nutrition, right, what are some of the mistakes you see people making regarding their nutrition that prevents them from getting as strong as they want to become or looking the way they would like to look? One, my big thing, my big thing is do not intermittent fast. Um, you're teaching your body to gorge at certain areas, increasing stomach size. What you'll find is that if you're eating five small meals a day, when you do have a cheat meal and do something incorrectly, your stomach's so small, you can't eat that much of it. <laughs> Virtual fasting, now I have these massive meals. My stomach's huge. So now when I want to go eat pizza, I'll eat a whole pizza versus if I've had five small meals for 30 days, I can only eat two pieces and my stomach feels like it's going to explode. So long-term, I find that intermittent fasting actually does not help long-term. I've done this with a, quite a few mm -hmm. names, if not close to a hundred different fire departments and most uh, fire department employees and mo for most that adopt a fasting protocol gain all the back plus some, and the others that follow what I tell them to do all either lose weight 
or they maintain healthy weight. Okay. So for me, I'm a huge anti faster. So that's number one. Number two, always go and get consistent blood work because what you think is healthy nutrition and what I think is healthy nutrition can be completely found out 100% through our blood work. So I might be able to eat a boatload of red meat and not affect my cholesterol at all, but you might eat a boatload of red meat and it starts affecting your triglycerides, cholesterol, Mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Same thing with sugar. Some people get a boatload of junk food. They have no problems with their diet, with their sugars or metabolic issues. And some people eat like shit for five years and they're pre-diabetic. Yes. Yep. Knowing your blood work and knowing what you're um, susceptible to genetically plays a huge factor in your diet. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, I've had a couple of clients where they're surprised when I say, you know, what? have you, when is the last time you went to the doctor? It's been too long. It's like, either go to the doctor or just go get yourself a blood glucose kit, check in the morning. They're shocked when they see 110, 120. And I'm not shocked. I'm like, yeah, you're a pre-diabetic. And they're like, wow. I'm like, yeah. (laughs) You know, that's that that's a thing. But the, the labs don't lie. They're just black and white. The labs don't have. <laughs> yeah. The other thing on nutrition wise, I think most people are very deficient in omega three triglycerides, which should be mm-hmm. oil. Um, fish oil is huge for skin, eye, brain and muscle health and soreness. Yes. And the other thing is 75 percent of the uh, entire world population is deficient in magnesium. Yes a metabolic precursor to diabetes it also keeps the brain and the muscles from relaxing it has 299 other functions <laughs> the body that helps it to do all kinds of different regulatory functions and you find that 75 percent of those people are deficient in that that's a big problem now to get it nutritional wise baby spinach which absorbability is not great but like mm-hmm. There's a lot of different foods that have it, but if you start looking at the foods that are fairly high in magnesium, a lot of them are not well eaten constantly. Yeah, uh, certain nuts also have high magnesium. But when's the last time you walk into a grocery store or a gas station and you see a person pick up a snack and it's a bag of nuts? Yeah, <laughs> gummy bears. It's yes, you know, candy bars. It's all these things that have zero magnesium in them. Yes, this is true. This is true. This is true. Could you slightly get closer to your mic? Please, I think sometime when you first start talking slightly off. Better? Yes, that, that is perfect. Yes. Okay, that's perfect. Yep. Sure. So with the magnesium, yes, I noticed that with myself. When I started supplementing with magnesium, I immediately noticed the difference. Like after leg days, it literally cut recovery off by a day. It reduced recovery by a day. It, yeah, it was like amazing. People, <laughs> yeah, most people, if they take magnesium within the first three to five days, are going to notice a big difference. Now, yes. the trick with magnesium is you have to get it from a reputable source because most of the stuff that's made in the USA is not regulated by any other, it's definitely not regulated by the FDA. Yes. But it's also not even regulated by really any other major company. So we, at the high level, the high level athletes usually utilize companies from Canada because Canadian oh. supplementation companies are regulated by their FDA very stringently. They're treated like drugs. Oh, wow. So I did not I know that. my stuff from a, a company called ATP Labs ATP. based out of Canada, and they, you would be shocked at how many Olympic athletes take stuff from ATP. Okay. I'm definitely going to get some magnesium from there because, yeah, I know there is – I personally use Thorn. <clears throat> I know there are NSF. Yeah, Thorn's a good brand. I like them because I think some Olympic athletes use them as well, and they have some kind of quality control around, you know, for yeah, the – Thorn's really artists. good. ATP yeah. is my favorite. And then there's another company called Designs for Health that is also a very solid company. Designs for Health. Yep. Okay. I don't think Thorn really does a magnesium, though. Like a pure magnesium, I don't think. So the ATP yeah, labs, I like to look into them for magnesium. ATP has a couple different kinds. My favorite is called Center Mag, which is magnesium glycinate. But they also make a Mind Mag, which is to help with your brain function, which is made of magnesium theonate. Mm-hmm. And theonate is the only magnesium that they know of that actually crosses the blood-brain, blood-brain barrier. barrier. Okay. I am definitely going to do this. Yeah, I'm order these tonight because yeah, I use uh what do I use natural cat magnesium. <clears throat> That's the one that I currently use. Um, but yeah, I know Thorne doesn't do a magnesium as far as I know, at least the last time I checked. All right, try mm-hmm. try that ATP labs and see what you I'm think. I'm going to do that. Yeah. And you talked on intermittent fasting. What I noticed, well, I first of all, the studies show <clears throat> it's not better than any other diet. There's yeah. an illusion that it's somewhat better, but statistically it's the same as anything. 
The next thing you point out, I noticed this kind of happened on a weekend. Like Monday to Friday, I'm very diligent with my five meals. But sometime on the weekend, I fall behind. And inevitably, I get to that point where I'm tempted to gorge, to your point. And I'm much more likely to eat bad because I've gone so long that now I could devour two racks of baby back ribs. And I'll try to justify it to say, well, you know, I'm behind. Let me catch up. But if I was on track, I wouldn't be eating two full racks of baby back ribs. And I, I can't eat that. <laughs> you know what I'll do to help me before a cheat meal mm-hmm. is I will actually eat one of my other meals that I was supposed to eat that day one hour before my cheat meal. Now I'll still go and enjoy the food, but I can't right. eat as much of it. That's a great idea. <laughs> that's, yeah, right. that's a good one. I like that. I like that. That's a good one. No, that's yeah, you can really still go have fun. You can still have a couple of chicken wings or some boneless yeah. wings or a couple of slices of pizza. But yeah. if you already had a meal an hour ago, you're yeah. not hungry. Yep. This is true. As a matter of fact, hungry. yeah. You know, because I've done this before where not on purpose, purely accidental. I ate dinner and then I went to the movies and I was like, man, I really want those box of raisinets. But I was like, yeah, I'm kind of full. I'll pass on the raisinets or something. Yeah, like. if you went there empty stomach, you'd be like, oh, shit. Yes. <laughs> I want those really bad, right? Yes, and sometimes I do two boxes and then I like, damn it, I should have just done one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can't, re- I can't re- resist. Now, recovery. <laughs> You had this really good video on recovery, right? And I want to touch on two of the low-hanging fruits you talked about. One was yeah. the benefit of naps. I nap, I believe in them, and proper hydration and salt. Because everything you talked about with the salt, I personally experienced myself. So tell us about the benefits of naps. <laughs> well, for most people, they have a hard time getting that solid, I, I consider, eight and a half hours of sleep. Yeah. So when I was at my strongest, I was sleeping 11 hours a day. Wow. That's what it took to squat the 1197. Yes. <laughs> um, but most people over overlook the importance of sleep. And if you look at a lot of stand efforting stuff, he'll mm. actually do a sleep uh, assessment before he gives diet advice. Because for a lot okay. of people, when they start having sleep issues, they actually have problems losing body fat. Oh, yes. Big time. Big time. Big time. Yeah. So I think that's one of the biggest advantages that I had as an athlete was I was a good sleeper. Um, so the naps help to kind of get that system down. Plus, if you're trying to gain muscle mass, a nap in the middle of the day will slow your metabolic rate down to allow you to put on some more muscle. Okay. Right. Because if you're constantly moving all day, the body's mm-hmm. going to be in a high caloric expenditure. If you yes. slow that down, it will help you to gain weight. So for people that, that are sense. hard gainers, take a nap, you know, go eat, take a 10 minute walk and mm-hmm. then take a 30 minute nap and yeah. bam, there you go. That's that's a great. I hadn't thought about that. And you the other benefits of naps, like for example, with <clears throat> lowering the risk of heart attacks, things of that nature. Uh, and I always feel great when I've taken a nap. You know, if it, especially if I'm going to go to the gym, like the nap earlier, I can feel the difference that day in the gym for sure. When your body feels powerful, it's because it's recovered. When yes. you feel sluggish, it's because some of that probably nutrition, sleep, mm-hmm. or your training is off. Is if off. you uh, and if you develop those areas and you keep a good log on that, you mm-hmm. can usually track down the culprit of the issue. Yes. Some years ago, I got this ring, this, I don't know if you can see it, this Ura ring and ridiculously accurate. You know, a lot of legitimate people use it, some professionals, some hospitals use it. And whenever it tells me I had a bad night, I can feel it in the gym. <laughs> and if I forget to look and then I'm weaker and then I check it, it says, yes, you know, perhaps you should have taken it easy today. And yeah, the, the power of sleep is, yeah, you, what, what, there's a saying I like, if you cheat on sleep, her twin sister death will avenge her. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's a great saying, but yeah, yeah, that's the one big thing you notice that nobody wants to talk about. And most importantly, go look at the views on my YouTube video talking about sleep. Nobody yeah. wants to hear it. Nope. 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 I know. I did notice. <laughs> you start talking about this bicep routine or yes. a bench routine, <laughs> everybody wants to hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I did notice that. I did notice that. But yeah, I yeah, sleep is sleep is incredible. It's funny because like you you're trying to lose weight, some of these hormones go to whack. The hormone that controls your hunger, the ghrelin goes out to whack. Now you want to devour and things like. And I remember the first time I read it, where you're more likely to crave sugary things, and it dawned on me because this is before I got the worrying, and my sleep was bad. I used to be puzzled. Why is it I'd walk into the supermarket sometime like I was drawn to the to the fruit? Like there was like a drug or something. And I started to put two and two together. If I had a bad night's sleep and I went in the grocery store, I would inevitably want something sweet, super sweet. If I had a yep. good night's sleep, 
the grapes didn't look that appealing to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Your brain was more keto-ish if you had a yes. good sleep. It was more diabetic if you didn't. Yes. Pretty much. I mean, it, it was crazy. It was like, I was like, wow, this is exactly what I'm reading in this book. <laughs> so, uh-huh. Exactly so, right. Man. And then you talked about hydration and salt. That I thought was interesting because, so my blood pressure is really good and my salt is much higher. But when I would do labs, my salt was either in the middle or lower end of the range. And I remember the doctor saying, yeah, you got to start getting more salt in. And I would also notice that at night, my chest would droop, right? And I remember one time, I think I was asking the coach and he was like, hey, it's not like you got a low salt. And I, that day I bought a rack of baby back ribs and I'm not exaggerating. It's like the minute I finished eating, it's like my chest just went up. It just literally just grew. <laughs> it was well, crazy. You know, muscles, muscle 70 plus percent water. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you are low on salt, you're low on hydration. Really, people mm-hmm. talk about how much water you drink in a day, but it really is regulatory, regulated by how much you absorb through the sodium. And that's where it's very important. But sodium got a bad rap probably 60, 80 years ago because of the foods it was acquired by, mm-hmm. right? So if I get some salt from a very lean piece of filet or sirloin, mm-hmm. that's not the same sodium content as a cheeseburger. No. <laughs> Bread and the ketchup and all the things that are basically worthless. Yeah. Yes. So the point being is that the food itself got bastardized. And a lot of that was done with questionnaires, but mm-hmm. you start studying, there's a book called the salt fix. Okay. It's a very interesting read. So, um, I think it's called the salt fix. Yeah, but it, it's very interesting. I'd have to look it up and find out what it is. Okay. I think it's called the salt fix, but it basically demyths all of that. Yeah. 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 Cause I know some of the research I've done, they were pointing out that, yeah, historically we consumed quite a lot of salt and also more potassium as well. You know, so that's the other thing we did. We took more salt from the cheeseburger and then potassium levels went <laughs> through the floor. The yeah. double whammy. That's what we noticed that new Gatorade that's out that. The advanced Gatorade's got more potassium in it. Ah, okay. So they've it's actually always, that out. Yeah, I got to check that out because previously I always went with coconut water as an electrolyte because it had way more potassium. Because the other drinks just practically had no potassium in them for all practical purposes. Yeah, absolutely. So I used to use Gatorade. I mean, coconut water quite a bit. Yeah, that's actually not a bad idea either. Yeah, yeah, and it's I mean, it's natural. It, all kind of goodness in there. <laughs> you also talked about hot and cold contrasts. Have you ever tried cryotherapy? Yeah, I have. I'm not really, I wouldn't say it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. From my opinion, I'm a huge fan of sauna, cold baths, and hot tub. Okay. Those are the big things that I use all the time and have gotten really good results from. Mm-hmm. So I kind of stick to those. Okay. I've done cryotherapy mm-hmm. once, but I've noticed that if I get in an ice tub, it's way more shocking than cryotherapy. Yes. Yeah, um, way more shocking. So yeah. for me, the it's way cheaper too. So you don't yes. need these <laughs> machines. You just yeah. go get a couple five, 10 pound bags of ice nice. from the gas station, dump it in yes. a big yes. horse drop and just get in the damn thing, right? I thought I was the only one going to the gas station because no, <laughs> when I, mean, I they would look at me strange, like, is this dude partying or is he? What's yeah, he doing? yeah, yeah, yeah. It was funny. It's, yeah, it's when I was doing triathlons, I had these long bike rides and stuff and the long run the next day. I'd get a big bag as I'd fill it up in the tub and jump in there. And yeah, they, they work, add some Epsom salt. And yeah, they worked. It worked magic for sure. Absolutely. magic. So the hot and cold contrast, is that something you could do at home with, say, a hot shower to then jump in the ice or bath? Okay. Oh, absolutely. You could even do it if it's cold enough. Like here in Ohio in the mm-hmm. winter, the tap water comes out at about 48 degrees. Oh, wow. Yeah, so cool. it's cold. Yeah. So yeah. I I have a shower with dual heads, so one will be cold, one will be hot, and I'll just ah. go back and forth in the winter time. Okay, nice. You'll get similar results. I wouldn't say it's as good, but if you're mm-hmm. on a budget, it's close. Yeah. Okay. So you could do like the hot shower and then jump in the tub with the cold water. Okay. Okay. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah. Or just change your just change your faucet. You know, on your shower. Yes. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. You could do that. Yeah. That's maybe even simpler. Actually. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point. And you raise a good point to it's much more affordable. <laughs> that's the other point than going to the craft ever because that stuff is not cheap. You're right. That's a that's, that's a, cheap. It's a pretty good point. <clears throat> Absolutely. Good point. And do you use a massage gun? And what's your thoughts on like massage therapy? I assume you probably get massages. Yeah, I mean, I don't get them as much as I want to because my work schedule is so crazy. But mm-hmm. uh, what we use is what Charles taught me in Prague, which was called Charles Paulkin, which was called guasha, which to the naked eye, it looks like Graston, which is scraping. But yes. we use 
natural buffalo bone tool <clears throat> with coconut oil and we basically work at a certain speed on the muscles and it just makes them go limp like basically a deep tissue massage but it's okay instant. not only does it loosen up the muscles it increases flexibility by 20 percent in three minutes oh wow you know how to do it correctly it's insane yeah so i'm a big fan of that plus i've already taught a couple of my training partners so mm -hmm. they can basically loosen up every muscle that i've worked that day okay in 10 to 12 minutes yeah. versus going and spending a hundred bucks on a massage therapist for an hour yes I'm going to have to look that gorge up because, yeah, that was in the same video as well. And I ne I'd never heard of it, to be honest. I've yeah, done Graston yeah. techniques. G-A-U-S-H-A. -A. Yeah. I'm going to well, look, look it up, up see if we can find some. From China. Yeah. Um, and Charles uses a lot. Charles Polycon uses a lot on his athletes. Wow. I bring it back and use it fairly irregular here. Okay. I want to see if I can find somebody local. I mean, where I live, thankfully, there are a lot of people around here. So I could probably yeah, find that. Yeah. Wash a practitioner. Yeah. I've definitely done the Graston technique. I mean, I've had it done on me and it definitely very painful, but it was definitely effective. Yeah. The problem is, is that stainless steel is not an organic um, tool. So yeah. the resonance of the cells, at least from what the Chinese say, the body can recognize organic to non-organic. So when you're using stainless oh. steel tooling, the body will actually create a resistance to it. Whereas the organic buffalo bone will actually res uh, utilize the same resonance with the tissue. Okay. China taught us and I was like thought it was a little bit crazy but when yeah. you start when you actually have it done you're like oh they they know what they're talking about yeah that that makes that makes a lot of sense actually uh, I mean I tried uh what's the thing called acupuncture before and everything the guy did and told me it worked I definitely felt I don't know if it was just the you know the placebo effect is a real thing but it definitely, even if it was only placebo, but yeah, it definitely worked. <clears throat> yeah, no, I've had I've had acupuncture done before. I actually had one of the best in the world. I went to Australia in 2012 and spoke there. And okay. one, of the, one of their top acupuncturists from Sydney mm -hmm. asked if he would, would, would be willing to work on me. And I said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So he does it to my entire neck and spine mm -hmm. and all the spots in my leg. And my yeah. back felt 100% for four months. Wow. Because I was complaining to one of the other guys and he overheard. I was like, man, yeah. that 18 hour plane flight kicked my ass. Yeah. My back. And he goes, would you mind if I just use some acupuncture? Yeah. And my back felt amazing the rest of the time I was there. Yeah. And I got back from another 18 hour plane flight mm -hmm. and my back felt good for another month and a half. Wow. I was like, wow. holy shit. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you know, I tell, yeah. I tell people that there are people out there in this world, right? Like this gentleman you describe, there's this chiropractor I know who got an acupuncture degree, just be able to do some dry needling, you know, really, really good massage people that these people can just do some amazing things on your body. You know, like I had a friend, some sciatical pain and doctor wanted to surgery, I sent her to this guy, no more surgery, you know, but you just got to find these, <laughs> these people, they're hard to find, but if you, if you find them, yeah, they can just work magic, literally work magic on your body. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. So we're about to wrap things up now. And we already touched on diet supplement and workout gimmicks. But um, is there any specific diet supplement or workout gimmicks or trends you would advise people to avoid <laughs> specifically? Hmm. Any additional well, things? I'm trying to think of right off the top of my head. I mean, yeah. I would say, you know, there are three things that I look for for somebody I'm going to listen to. I think this kind of falls along the line of that question. Okay. One, the workout or the thing I'm following backed by somebody that's insanely strong. That's one. Okay. Yeah. Two, when that person got strong, did they were they able to stay strong for at least 10 years with minimal to no injuries? Okay. Three, what is the education level of the person that you're buying a program from or a supplement? So if you have education, strength, longevity, and strength mm -hmm. itself. Yeah. I'm not I'm just talking in the strength world. That mm -hmm. person probably knows what he's talking about and is probably selling you a product that's got its best intentions. Yeah. But you find that a lot of people that are selling something, they're not one, they don't have the education. Two, if they got strong, they didn't stay very strong very long because they didn't mm -hmm. train very smart. Yeah. So here's the other big things is if somebody's selling you a program that's not at least 12 weeks long, then they're setting you up for long-term failure because yes. it's 12 weeks in order to see a realistic result. Yeah. And I that's mean, the yeah. minimum. Yep. No, I, so now, I agree. This. If you're talking <laughs> education and you're talking longevity and mm -hmm. you're talking strength level, and then you're talking 
12 weeks, that just cut out 80% of what you see on the internet. Yes. Yep. Because, maybe yeah, maybe not because I just saw a video was like lose, is either lose 15 pounds in 17 days. I mean, I didn't watch the video. It popped up 15 pounds in 17 days or 17 pounds, 15 days. And I'm like, what? What? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see this. And it's unfortunate because, again, like I said earlier, people want to believe. So when they see a picture of a guy or a lady, oh, I lost 30 pounds in 30 days or 40 pounds in a month or a month, people are like, that could be me. And I'm, and I'm trying to tell them, no, it cannot be you. It will never be you. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, very, it's, it's so tempting. It's like I saw this video where this guy, he's making fun of the, the other thing. He's like, you know, drink this thing to, I think, unclog your arteries. And the guy said, like, well, that's not enough. It should not only unplug your arteries, it should also make you sleep good. You know, they keep building on the nonsense, and that makes the videos be even more watchable with the nonsense. God. Yeah, and that's the biggest problem. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And if it's it selling is. it short term, it's not yes. probably good for you long term. Yeah. Those are my biggest things. I think that if people follow what we just talked about in the last three to five minutes, it's going to keep yeah. them away from a lot of garbage. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. Man, this has been exceeded all my high expectations and I have very high expectations because I know you're a super duper knowledgeable gentleman and thank you so much for taking time with your very busy schedule and in my full-time job I have to interview people like yourself that are incredibly busy <laughs> so I, I really appreciate you taking time with your busy schedule to meet with me here today and I'm sure spreading this knowledge will definitely help <laughs> out there but thank yeah, you so hopefully, much hopefully it does we I appreciate you having me on no, no, thanks. Anytime, anytime. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. So, man, okay. So I'll cut here and my editor will edit things. But no, man, thank you so much. You, Yeah, I'm going to rewatch this because I took some notes, but. <laughs> so, yeah, I know how it goes. It's it's hard to, it's hard. You got to rewatch it and kind of absorb it. Yes, because you, you said so much good stuff in here, man. But tonight I'm definitely going to go and get the ATP lab stuff because, yeah, the magnesium, I really know the difference with magnesium for myself. No doubt about big, it. Big time, big time. Big time, you know. So, man, again, thank you so much. I really right. appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening and stay safe. All right. Talk to you soon. Right, take care, brother. Thank you. Later, brother. Bye.